Blake is a radical. It's the scope and scale of his radicalism that has brought him so many 20th century admirers. From 1789 to 1820, he was a maker of books. Other people were painters or engravers, all poets, all publishers. Blake did for himself all the tasks performed on a book before it reaches the reader. Writing, designing, etching, printing and selling. His first prospectus in October 1793 was a declaration of independence. Previous artists, even Milton and Shakespeare, suffered, he said, because they neglected the means of getting the productions of their labours and genius to the public. He announces ten books of a new kind ready for sale from his home in Lambeth. The Marriage of Heaven and Hell appears six on the list, a quarto with 14 designs in illuminated printing, priced seven shillings and sixpence. At first he thought he could free himself from rich art patrons and from the commercial publishing machine. He claimed his method of etching words and illustrations as one design on wax plates would give the general public high art in a style more ornamental, uniform and grand than any before discovered. And it would bring down the price. He promised to produce his books at a quarter of the cost of a conventional book of printed materials plus engravings. Because he never found more than a handful of buyers, the commercial calculations didn't work. By the time he was publishing the last of his masterpieces, The Mass of Jerusalem, his prices had gone up by seven to ten times, and he reckoned that his books in illuminated printing were still unprofitable. His inventions didn't make him financially independent. Still less did they create a public for an art that proclaimed the independence of every individual. The Marriage of Heaven and Hell introduces the unique Blakean series of modern illuminated books that are also modern prophecies. In it, for the one and only time, Blake acts out his real-life role as a London engraver, self-employed writer and artisan. During the four years Blake worked on The Marriage, 1790 to 94, he was producing other prophecies which welcomed the French Revolution and looked forward to revolution on every continent. Three works of these years, America, Europe and The Song of Loss, are physically big and set on a huge stage, the geography of most of the world and quite a bit of its history. But the standard size, Marriage of Heaven and Hell, has Blake himself moving about in London circles where he was actually at home, among free-thinking artists and writers, radical dissenters and workers in the print trade. We get inside the busy printing house Blake often entered as a workman, as one of the blackened figures humorously known as printer's devils. And we see him comfortably at home in 13 Hercules buildings Lambeth, rooms on an approach road to Westminster Bridge, where he and his wife also had their workplace and shop. The joke that turns printer's devils literally into the inhabitants of hell is typical of this most cheerful of Blake's productions. It's a classic comic device to read black as white and to turn the conventional world upside down. Religion's existing rule books urge us to separate heaven from hell, good from evil, angels from devils, soul from body, with a view to steering well clear of the second option. Blake's devilish mentors swap the pairs round or show that the best authorities have never agreed on how to tell Satan from the Messiah. Even the title is ironic and misleading if taken at face value. Blake provocatively celebrates virtues we normally consign to hell. His hell is a productive, energising chaos. In particular, he sings the delights of disobedience. When Blake, acting himself, moves about in this book, he encounters a world full of mental activity, exhilarating to be in. I was walking among the fires of hell, delighted with the enjoyments of genius which to angels look like torment and insanity. In the infernal regions, which are also London, he puts together a collection of his contemporaries' freest ideas in the form of 70 aphorisms. Anonymous Londoners propose their own new guidelines in the format of the ancient Hebrew book of Proverbs. These proverbs of hell don't conform to any existing philosophy or party line, but they do share an attitude, disrespect. 
We shouldn't be bound by the laws of our fathers, whatever Edmund Burke was currently urging on the British in his Reflections on the Revolution in France. Drive your cart and your plough over the bones of the dead, says one new proverb, or sooner murder an infant in its cradle than nurse unacted desires. All Blake's major prophecies, which means almost all his publications after the early Songs of Innocence and Experience, one way or another rewrite the Bible. The Bible remains his great model because it's the Western world's founding and universal book. Like the sacred books of other cultures, the Bible deals in the Jewish people's communal experiences, revolution, war, famine, the wickedness of rulers and the disasters of history. More important for Blake, it testifies to human imagination. As individual poets or prophets, have applied it to great subjects. But there are things the Bible shouldn't do. Tell us fixed truths in a fixed way, or lay down moral law. The trouble with books is that they harden into stone once the living process of making them is complete. Blake's truculence can resemble the lower-class Protestantism of the first half of the 17th century. One of the pleasures of reading him now is to trace older historical continuities that make him so strange a late 18th century writer. Through his reading, or through his contacts with radical Protestant sects, he has a spiritual self-reliance and an impatience of authority we associate with the diggers and ranters of the English Civil War. Perhaps the most powerful voice of popular Protestantism that's heard in The Marriage of Heaven and Hell belongs to the German tailor and prophet Jacob Burma, a strong critic of rulers and a believer in contrariness. In one work of 1612, Burma argues that the conflict of good and evil, wrath and love, conditions the individual's desire for freedom. Conflict is beneficial. But Blake's style of unorthodoxy is also deeply typical of his own age. He knew the sceptical French tradition of biblical criticism, which ran from Voltaire to Blake's contemporary Volney, then on to Tom Paine, who in 1794 debunked the Old Testament in The Age of Reason. Blake probably had better access to intellectuals and to new books between 1790 and 95, his most prolific period, than at other times of his life. The main reason was that he sometimes worked for Joseph Johnson, the leading literary publisher and an active radical dissenter. Among Johnson's other projects at this time was a great illustrated edition of Milton. The marriage often echoes Paradise Lost, an infernal text if ever there was one. Johnson also became the patron and employer of Alexander Geddes, a Catholic priest who in 1792 published his new translation of the Old Testament preceded by a controversial essay that summed up the sceptical 18th century case against the Bible, that it isn't the word of God, that it's a collection of fragments written by many different people at different times, that it's been used in history by bad men for bad ends. Blake, Geddes, Payne, Wollstonecraft, Godwin, all belong to the same social network at this time, with Joseph Johnson's publishing business at its centre. If Blake's printing house in hell has an earthly location, Johnson's shop in St Paul's Churchyard is probably the place. At a supper party with Blake, Isaiah talks like an up-to-date, intelligent sceptic of the day. He didn't really hear the voice of God. He voiced his own honest indignation. Ezekiel, another of the Bible's radicals and true prophets, sits at the same table and complains that the Jews' code got imposed on other nations, and what greater subjection can be? The conversation with the two biblical poets is the central scene, appropriately since they prompt Blake to write his own infernal scriptures or Bible of hell. Two other dialogues are especially important. Earlier, Blake the narrator encounters the devil, who as so often in literature is a clever fellow. It's the devil who teaches him the doctrine of contraries and gives him a taste for the proverbs of hell. After Isaiah and Ezekiel, Blake meets his last informant, the angel of orthodoxy. 
The angel specialises in laying down religious law and it's he who needs converting. Blake claims he has taught him by the end to read the Bible in its infernal or diabolical sense. Blake's dispute with the angel is the most intricate part of the book, the most imaginative and intellectually impressive. It's Blake who decides it must take the form of a contest in which each creates the world in accordance with the ideology of the other. First, Blake's hopes for a world revolution are realised in the conservative angel's imagination as a scene in outer space in which spiders crawl on fiery tracks. Out of the abyss, a huge monster erupts, crowned with a head marked like a tiger's. The devouring monster of this nightmare brings to mind the Parisian mob in the terror. That metaphor for revolution appears everywhere in speeches, print and caricature at the time. But the fact that the Leviathan is also tiger-headed and comes from the east suggests the angel is also worried by another bugbear of the day, Tipu, Sultan of Mysore, whose emblem was the tiger and whose wars with the East India Company came to a bloody climax in 1791. When it's Blake's turn to bring out the demons in his opponent's worldview, he imagines a universe of monkeys, chained, yet inclined as they grow more numerous, to dismember and even eat one another. This account conjures up the views of political economists from Mandeville to Turgo and Adam Smith, and in anticipation to Malthus. It's the new economics which, as Blake earlier reminds us, divides modern society into two classes, the prolific and the devouring, otherwise the productive and consuming, or those who labour and those who profit by labour. The cannibalistic monkeys are as much a caricature of the fashionable thinking of the upper orders, seen from the workers' perspective, as the tiger-headed monster is a Tory caricature of the insurgent mob and the hordes of Asia. By supplying these grim parodies of the democratic millennium and the world of market forces, Blake remarkably anticipates the polemic of a class war still to come. So it would be a pity to limit the significance of the angel by making him a spokesman for a small group. He stands in the book for static and authoritarian thinking generally. Yet Blake's text lends itself to a narrow interpretation by going on to attack the Swedish religious writer Emanuel Swedenborg, whose followers had set up a new church in Britain. Blake owned three of Swedenborg's long works of religious commentary, one of which is even called Heaven and Hell, and he annotated them critically. Broadly, he found the writings of the Swedish prophet timid, rule-bound and derivative. In the uncut Marriage of Heaven and Hell, he repeats these charges on two plates of illuminated printing which immediately follow the debate between Blake and the angel. This somewhat anticlimactic and over-particular passage is the only cut of substance in the adaptation you're about to hear. Most of the Marriage of Heaven and Hell is printed as numbered paragraphs imitating verses in the Bible. The general effect is of a natural-sounding prose, modern and informal compared with the unrhymed verse used in most of the prophecies. Two passages stand out because they do use verse in a heroic manner, the short opening argument and the song of liberty with which the marriage closes. In the opening line, Rintra, Blake as a prophet of wrath, gathers up the clouds of war. Meanwhile, the just man rages in the wilds, waiting to recover a pleasant land from which he's been exiled, perhaps from the beginning of history. That grandly abstract scene setting universalises the story of Blake the truculent printer's devil, identifying the book he's writing here as a contribution to remaking the world. As for the millenarian close with its cry, Empire is no more, listeners after 200 years may feel what Blake's first readers must have felt in the dark, war-torn year of 1794. We're still waiting. Rintra roars and shakes his fires in the burdened air. Hungry clouds swag on the deep. 
Once meek and in a perilous path, the just man kept his course along the vale of death. Roses are planted where thorns grow, and on the barren heath sing the honeybees. Then the perilous path was planted, and a river and a spring on every cliff and tomb, and on the bleached bones red clay brought forth. Till the villain left the paths of ease to walk in perilous paths and drive the just man into barren climes. Now the sneaking serpent walks in mild humility, and the just man rages in the wilds where lions roam. Rintra roars and shakes his fires in the burdened air. Hungry clouds swag on the deep. As a new heaven is begun, the eternal hell revives. Now is the dominion of Edom. And the return of Adam into paradise. See Isaiah chapters 34 and 5. Without contraries is no progression. Attraction and repulsion, reason and energy, love and hate are necessary to human existence. From these contraries spring what the religious call good and evil. Good is the passive that obeys reason. Evil is the active springing from energy. Good is heaven. Evil is hell. All Bibles or sacred codes have been the causes of the following errors, that man has two real existing principles, viz. a body and a soul, that energy called evil is alone from the body, and that reason called good is alone from the soul, that God will torment man in eternity for following his energies. But the following contraries to these are true. Man has no body distinct from his soul, for that called body is a portion of soul discerned by the five senses, the chief inlets of soul in this age. Energy is the only life, and is from the body, and reason is the bound or outward circumference of energy. Energy is eternal delight. Those who restrain desire do so because theirs is weak enough to be restrained, and the restrainer or reason usurps its place and governs the unwilling, and being restrained, it by degrees becomes passive till it is only the shadow of desire. The history of this is written in Paradise Lost, and the governor, or reason, is called Messiah. And the original archangel or possessor of the command of the heavenly host, is called the devil, or Satan, and his children are called sin and death. But in the book of Job, Milton's Messiah is called Satan, for this history has been adopted by both parties. It indeed appeared to reason as if desire was cast out, but the devil's account is that the Messiah fell and formed a heaven of what he stole from the abyss. This is shown in the gospel where he prays to the Father to send the comforter, or desire, that reason may have ideas to build on. The Jehovah of the Bible being no other than the devil, he who dwells in flaming fire. Know that after Christ's death, he became Jehovah. But in Milton, the father is destiny, the son, a ratio of the five senses, and the Holy Ghost, vacuum. The reason Milton wrote in fetters when he wrote of angels and God, and at liberty when of devils and hell, is because he was a true poet and of the devil's party without knowing it. As I was walking among the fires of hell, delighted with the enjoyments of genius, which to angels look like torment and insanity, I collected some of their proverbs, thinking that as the sayings used in a nation mark its character, so the proverbs of hell show the nature of infernal wisdom better than any description of buildings or garments. When I came home, on the abyss of the five senses, where a flat-sided steep frowns over the present world, I saw a mighty devil folded in black clouds hovering on the sides of the rock. With corroding fires he wrote the following sentence, now perceived by the minds of men and read by them on earth. How do you know but every bird that cuts the airy way is an immense world of delight closed by your senses five?
In seed time learn, in harvest teach, in winter enjoy. Drive your cart and your plough over the bones of the dead. The road of excess leads to the palace of wisdom. Prudence is a rich, ugly old maid courted by incapacity. He who desires but acts not breeds pestilence. The cut worm forgives the plough. Dip him in the river who loves water. A fool sees not the same tree that a wise man sees. He whose face gives no light shall never become a star. Eternity is in love with the productions of time. The busy bee has no time for sorrow. The hours of folly are measured by the clock, but of wisdom no clock can measure. All wholesome food is caught without a net or a trap. Bring out number, weight and measure in a year of dearth. No bird soars too high if he soars with his own wings. A dead body revenges not injuries. The most sublime act is to set another before you. If the fool would persist in his folly, he would become wise... Folly is the cloak of knavery. Shame is pride's cloak. Prisons are built with stones of law, brothels with bricks of religion. The pride of the peacock is the glory of God. The lust of the goat is the bounty of God. The wrath of the lion is the wisdom of God. The nakedness of woman is the work of God. Excess of sorrow laughs, excess of joy weeps. The roaring of lions, the howling of wolves, the raging of the stormy sea and the destructive sword are portions of eternity too great for the eye of man. The fox condemns the trap, not himself. Joys impregnate, sorrows bring forth. Let man wear the fell of the lion, woman the fleece of the sheep. The bird a nest, the spider a web, man friendship. The selfish smiling fool and the sullen frowning fool shall both be thought wise that they may be a rod. What is now proved was once only imagined. The rat, the mouse, the fox, the rabbit watch the roots, the lion. And the tiger, the horse, the elephant, watch the fruits. The cistern contains, the fountain overflows. One thought fills immensity. Always be ready to speak your mind, and a base man will avoid you. Everything possible to be believed is an image of truth. The eagle never lost so much time as when he submitted to learn of the crow. The fox provides for himself, but God provides for the lion. Think in the morning, act in the noon, eat in the evening, sleep in the night. He who has suffered you to impose on him knows you. As the plough follows words, so God rewards prayers. The tigers of wrath are wiser than the horses of instruction. Expect poison from the standing water. You never know what is enough unless you know what is more than enough. Ah, listen to the fool's reproach. It is a kingly title. The eyes of fire, the nostrils of air, the mouth of water, the beard of earth. The weak in courage is strong in cunning. The apple tree never asks the beech how he shall grow, nor the lion the horse how he shall take his prey. The thankful receiver bears a plentiful harvest. If others had not been foolish, we should be so. The soul of sweet delight can never be defiled. When thou seest an eagle, thou seest a portion of genius. Lift up thy head. As the caterpillar chooses the fairest leaves to lay her eggs on, so the priest lays his curse on the fairest joys. To create a little flower is the labour of ages. Jam braces, bless relaxes. The best wine is the oldest, the best water the newest. Prayers plough not, praises reap not, joys laugh not, sorrows weep not. The head sublime, the heart pathos, the genitals beauty, the hands and feet proportion. As the air to a bird or the sea to a fish, so is contempt to the contemptible. The crow wished everything was black, the owl that everything was white. Exuberance is beauty. If the lion was advised by the fox, he would be cunning. Improvement makes straight roads, but the crooked roads without improvement are roads of genius. Sooner murder an infant in its cradle than nurse unacted desires. Where man is not, nature is barren. Truth can never be told so as to be understood and not be believed. Enough! Or too much. Ancient poets animated all sensible objects with gods or geniuses, calling them by the names and adorning them with the properties of woods, rivers, mountains, lakes, cities, nations, and whatever their enlarged and numerous senses could perceive. And particularly they studied the genius of each city and country, placing it under its mental deity till a system was formed which some took advantage of and enslaved the vulgar by attempting to realise or abstract the mental deities from their objects. Thus began priesthood, choosing forms of worship from poetic tales, and at length they pronounced that the gods had ordered such things. Thus men forgot that all deities reside in the human breast. The prophets Isaiah and Ezekiel dined with me, and I asked them how they dared so roundly to assert that God spoke to them, and whether they did not think at the time that they would be misunderstood, and so be the cause of imposition. 
I saw no god, nor heard any, in a finite organical perception. But my senses discovered the infinite in everything. And uh, as I was then persuaded, and remain confirmed, that the voice of honest indignation is the voice of God. I cared not for consequences, but wrote. Mm. Does a firm persuasion that a thing is so make it so? Now, all poets believe that it does. <laughs> and in ages of imagination, his firm persuasion removed mountains. But uh, many are not capable of a firm persuasion of anything. The philosophy of the East taught the first principles of human perception. Some nations held one principle for the origin, and some another. We of Israel taught that the poetic genius, as you now call it, was the first principle, and all the others merely derivative. Quite, quite. Which was the cause of our despising the priests and philosophers of other countries, and prophesying that all gods would at last be proved to originate in ours and to be the tributaries of the poetic genius. Mm. It was this that our great poet uh, King David desired so fervently and invoked so pathetically, saying by this he conquers enemies and governs kingdoms. Mm. And so we loved our God, that we cursed in his name all the deities of surrounding nations and asserted that they had rebelled. Indeed. And from these opinions, the vulgar came to think that all nations would at last be subject to the Jews. This, like all firm persuasions, has come to pass. For all nations believe the Jews' code and worship the Jews' God. And what greater subjection can be? I heard this with some wonder. I must confess my own conviction. Isaiah, perhaps you would favour the world with your lost works. None of equal value was lost. No, nor of mine. Well, what made you go naked and barefoot three years? The same that made our friend Diogenes, the Grecian. Ezekiel, why did you eat dung and lie so long on your right and left side? <sighs> The desire of raising other men into a perception of the infinite. This the North American tribes practice. And is he honest who resists his genius or conscience only for the sake of present ease or gratification? The ancient tradition that the world will be consumed in fire at the end of 6,000 years is true, as I have heard from hell. For the cherub with his flaming sword is hereby commanded to leave his guard at Tree of Life, and when he does, the whole creation will be consumed and appear infinite and holy, whereas it now appears finite and corrupt. This will come to pass by an improvement of sensual enjoyment. But first, the notion that man has a body distinct from his soul is to be expunged. This I shall do by printing in the infernal method by corrosives, which in hell are salutary and medicinal, melting apparent surfaces away and displaying the infinite which was hid. If the doors of perception were cleansed, everything would appear to man as it is, infinite. For man has closed himself up till he sees all things through narrow chinks of his cavern. I was in a printing house in hell and saw the method in which knowledge is transmitted from generation to generation. In the first chamber was a dragon man clearing away the rubbish from a cave's mouth. Within, a number of dragons were hollowing the cave. In the second chamber was a viper folding round the rock and the cave and others adorning it with gold, silver and precious stones. In the third chamber was an eagle with wings and feathers of air he caused the inside of the cave to be infinite. Around were numbers of eagle-like men who built palaces in the immense cliffs. In the fourth chamber were lions of flaming fire, raging around and melting the metals into living fluids. In the fifth chamber were unnamed forms which cast the metals into the expanse. There they were received by men who occupied the sixth chamber and took the forms of books and were arranged in libraries. The giants who formed this world into its sensual existence and now seem to live in it in chains are in truth the causes of its life and the sources of all activity. But the chains are the cunning of weak and tame minds which have power to resist energy. According to the proverb, the weak in courage is strong in cunning. 
Thus, one portion of being is the prolific, the other the devouring. To the devourer, it seems as if the producer was in his chains, but it is not so. He only takes portions of existence and fancies that the whole. But the prolific would cease to be prolific unless the devourer, as a sea, received the excess of his delights. Some will say, is not God alone the prolific? I answer, God only acts and is in, in existing, existing beings, beings or men. men. These two classes of men are always upon earth, and they should be enemies. Whoever tries to reconcile them seeks to destroy existence. Religion is an endeavour to reconcile the two. Jesus Christ did not wish to unite, but to separate them, as in the parable of sheep and goats. And he says, I came not to send peace, but a sword. Messiah, or Satan, or tempter, was formerly thought to be one of the antediluvians, who are our energies. An angel came to me and said, Oh, pitiable, foolish young man, oh, horrible, oh, dreadful state, consider the hot burning dungeon thou art preparing for thyself to all eternity, to which thou art going in such career. Perhaps you will be willing to show me my eternal lot, and we will contemplate together upon it, and see whether your lot or mine is most desirable. So he took me through a stable and through a church, and down into the church vault, at the end of which was a mill. Through the mill we went, and came to a cave. Down the winding cavern we groped our tedious way, till a void, boundless as nether sky, appeared beneath us and we held by the roots of trees and hung over this immensity. If you please, we will commit ourselves to this void and see whether providence is here also. If you will not, I will. Do not presume, O oh young man, but as we here remain, behold thy lot, which will soon appear when the darkness passes away. So I remained with him, sitting in the twisted root of an oak. He was suspended in a fungus, which hung with the head downward into the deep. By degrees we beheld the infinite abyss, fiery as the smoke of a burning city. Beneath us, at an immense distance, was the sun, black but shining. Round it were fiery tracks on which revolved vast spiders crawling after their prey, which flew, or rather swam, in the infinite deep, in the most terrific shapes of animals sprung from corruption. And the air was full of them, and seemed composed of them. These are devils, and are called powers of the air. Which is my eternal lot? Between the black and white spiders. But now, from between the black and white spiders, a cloud and fire burst and rolled through the deep, blackening all beneath, so that the nether deep grew black as a sea and rolled with a terrible noise. Beneath us was nothing now to be seen but a black tempest. Till looking east between the clouds and the waves, we saw a cataract of blood mixed with fire, and not many stones throw from us appeared and sunk again the scaly fold of a monstrous serpent. At last, to the east, distant about three degrees, appeared a fiery crest above the waves. Slowly it reared like a ridge of golden rocks till we discovered two globes of crimson fire from which the sea fled away in clouds of smoke. And now we saw it was the head of Leviathan. His forehead was divided into streaks of green and purple like those on a tiger's forehead. Soon we saw his mouth and red gills hang just above the raging foam, tinging the black deep with beams of blood, advancing towards us with all the fury of a spiritual existence. My friend the angel climbed up from his station into the mill. I remained alone, and then this appearance was no more. But I found myself sitting on a pleasant bank beside a river by moonlight, hearing a harper. But I arose and sought for the mill, and there I found my angel. However did you escape? All that we saw was owing to your metaphysics. For when you ran away, I found myself on a bank by moonlight hearing a harper. But now we've seen my eternal lot. Shall I show you yours? <laughs> <laughs>
By force, I suddenly caught him in my arms and flew westerly through the night till we were elevated above the earth's shadow. Then I flung myself with him directly into the body of the sun. Here I clothed myself in white and sunk from the glorious climb and passed all the planets till we came to Saturn. Here I stayed to rest and then leapt into the void between Saturn and the fixed stars. Here is your lot, in this space, if space it may be called. Soon we saw the stable and the church, and I took him to the altar and opened the Bible, and lo, it was a deep pit into which I descended, driving the angel before me. Soon we saw seven houses of brick. One we entered. In it were a number of monkeys, baboons, and all of that species, chained by the middle, grinning and snatching at one another, but withheld by the shortness of their chains. However, I saw that they sometimes grew numerous, and then the weak were caught by the strong, and with a grinning aspect, first coupled with, and then devoured, by plucking off first one limb and then another, till the body was left a helpless trunk. This, after grinning and kissing it with seeming fondness, they devoured too. And here and there I saw one savourily picking the flesh of his own tail. As the stench terribly annoyed us both, we went into the mill, and I in my hand brought the skeleton of a body, which in the mill was Aristotle's analytics. Thy fantasy has imposed upon me, and thou oughtest to be ashamed. We impose on one another, and it is but lost time to converse with you whose works are only analytics. Once I saw a devil in a flame of fire, who arose before an angel that sat on a cloud, and the devil uttered these words. The worship of God is honouring his gifts in other men, each according to his genius, and loving the greatest men best. Those who envy or calumniate great men hate God, for there is no other God. The angel, hearing this, became almost blue, but mastering himself, he grew yellow, and at last white, pink, and smiling. Thou idolater, is not God one, and is he not visible in Jesus Christ? And has not Jesus Christ given his sanction to the law of ten commandments? And are not all other men fools, sinners, and nothings? Bray a fool in a mortar with wheat, yet shall not his folly be beaten out of him. If Jesus Christ is the greatest man, you ought to love him in the greatest degree. Now hear how he has given his sanction to the law of ten commandments. Did he not mock at the Sabbath, and so mock the Sabbath's God? Murder those who were murdered because of him? Turn away the law from the woman taken in adultery? Steal the labour of others to support him? Bear false witness when he omitted making a defence before Pilate? Covet when he prayed for his disciples, and when he bid them shake off the dust of their feet against such as refused to lodge them? I tell you, no virtue can exist without breaking these Ten Commandments. Jesus was all virtue and acted from impulse, not from rules. When he had so spoken, I beheld the angel who stretched out his arms, embracing the flame of fire, and he was consumed and arose as Elijah. This angel, who is now become a devil, is my particular friend. We often read the Bible together in its infernal or diabolical sense, which the world shall have, if they behave well. I have also the Bible of hell, which the world shall have, whether they will or no. One law for the lion and ox is oppression. The eternal female groaned. It was heard over all the earth. Albion's coast is sick silent. The American meadows faint. Shadows of prophecy shiver along by the lakes and the rivers and mutter across the ocean. France, rend down thy dungeon. Golden Spain, burst the barriers of old Rome. Cast thy keys, O Rome, into the deep downfalling, even to eternity downfalling, and weep. In her trembling hand she took the newborn terror, howling. On those infinite mountains of light, now barred out by the Atlantic Sea, the newborn fire stood before the starry king. Flagged with grey-browed snows and thunderous visages, the jealous wings waved over the deep. The speary hand burned aloft, unbuckled was the shield. Forth went the hand of jealousy among the flaming hair and hurled the newborn wonder through the starry night. The fire, the fire is falling. Look up, look up. O citizen of London, enlarge thy countenance. O Jew, leave counting gold, return to thy oil and wine. O African, black African. Go, winged thought, widen his forehead. 
The fiery limbs, the flaming hair, shot like the sinking sun to the western sea. Waked from his eternal sleep, the hoary element roaring fled away. Down rushed, beating his wings in vain, the jealous king. His grey-browed counsellors, thunderous warriors, curled veterans among helms and shields and chariots. Horses, elephants, banners, castles, slings and rocks. Falling, rushing, ruining, buried in the ruins on her Thona's dens. All night beneath the ruins then, their sullen flames faded, emerged round the gloomy king with thunder and fire. Leading his starry hosts through the waste wilderness, he promulgates his ten commands, glancing his beamy eyelids over the deep in dark dismay. Where the sun of fire and his eastern cloud, while the morning plumes her golden breast. Spurning the clouds written with curses, stamps the stony lord to dust, loosing the eternal horses from the dens of night, crying, Empire is no more, and now the lion and the wolf shall cease. Let the priests of the raven of dawn, no longer in deadly black, with horse note curse the sons of joy, nor his accepted brethren, whom tyrant he calls free, lay the bound or build the roof. Nor pale religious lechery call that virginity that wishes but acts not. For everything that lives is holy. For everything that lives is holy. <laughs>